Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and mm -hmm. I'm going to be your facilitator for today's call. And today we're doing one of our series of Ask Dr. Tam and she's with us today and we're so glad about that. And this session today is sponsored by Vitas Healthcare and Candace Ramos is with us. And tell us a little bit about um, Vitas, Candace. Sure, thank you. How many minutes do I have now? Uh. 50, 56, um, just kidding. Um, so I am Candace Ramos with Vitas Healthcare and we provide hospice care wherever a loved one, your loved one calls home. So that could be in an actual residential care home, in a nursing home, assisted living, um, wherever your loved one might live. The one great thing about hospice is that hospice comes in as additional support to you as a caregiver to also help you navigate additional care. With hospice comes the interdisciplinary team that is comprised of a doctor, a registered nurse that does medication management, symptom management and teaching, a home health aide that provides assistance with activities of daily living based upon the plan of care for your specific loved one, a social worker that helps with caregiver support, respite, placement, Medicaid pending, VA benefits, navigating the VA system, a chaplain that provides spiritual needs, as well as our VTOS volunteers. If you're interested in having VTOS come out to provide some information, feel free to call us at 1-800-93. V-I-T-A-S, or visit us at www.vitas.com. Well, and Candace also did a session on uh, hospice care, and that will be a podcast also that you can look that up if you want more information, and she will share that with you through a podcast. Thank you, Candace. So now let me introduce Dr. Tam to you if you have not heard her little brief bio before. Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with a message to, mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Dr. Tam, as usual, welcome. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you, Candace and Vitas. Thank you, Minerva and WellMed Charitable Foundation. And thank all of you for joining us today. Um, Glenda and I have decided to sort of talk about grief and guilt and other fun related topics today. And this came about um, for two reasons. One, I got, uh, I received a letter from a lady um, talking about her feelings. And right after that, I stumbled, well, actually I got an email uh, on the same topic from the Alzheimer's Society.uk. Um, and so uh, without any further warning to Glenda, I said, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Glenda said, oh, okay. And so uh, today we're going to talk about grief and guilt and, and other things that, that come up for caregivers. So Glenda, shall we start with the letter? We did. Tam got a letter, um, and I'll just use her first name, Pam. Um, and so we've started our other sessions this way, and so Tam thought it would be a good way to start this session also. So let me read this letter. The pain is unbearable once you have to make the decision for your spouse to be moved into memory care after 12 years of watching him decline since age 58. The last six months prior to moving him in in March of 2023, he started just collapsing and has not been able to hardly speak for a year or more. He has not been able to use or know what items are about for about two years. The problem is that the staff, even at a good place, is ill-equipped for these residents. I watch them put two to three bites of food in someone's mouth and give up and move. I pay extra for a caregiver to come to the facility that is costing a fortune to make sure my husband gets fed and gets drinks. He, doesn't not, he does not know to open his mouth most of the time and is not able to understand how to use a spoon but he can still walk all day. I'm struggling with the amount of time to visit. He is an hour from me, but when I stay more than an hour, he is very agitated when I leave. So he is, so he is medicated. 
It seems 30 to 45 minutes works better, but harder on me. It seems I have been grieving every day all these years, and it just continues as I watch him disappear more every day. I can hardly breathe sometimes while at home feeling so guilty. He is in that facility, just walking around and not knowing what, if anything, his mind remembers. The hardest thing is I do not want him to think I have abandoned him at this time in his life, but trying my best to give him what he needs and deserves. My mind plays games trying to figure out how to get him home where he could be safe, but realistically, that's not possible. I hope this helps someone with this decision coming up, praying for each of you. And that was from Pam. And I sent her back a message that said, oh, goodness, please call me as soon as you can. Um, yeah. Seriously, y'all, when you send me letters, please add your phone number to it. And, an, and another note, if you call me and I don't respond within 48 hours, call me again. If I don't respond within 24 hours, call me again. Glenda, I sometimes get behind on sometimes, constantly behind on stuff, <laughs> but I get behind and I called a lady last week and she had called me a month ago and now it was too late uh -huh. when she was calling me. So please call me again. You're not bothering me. Um, things I heard in that letter that were just the things that you and I have heard over and over and over, Glenda, is how long this woman has been a caregiver. And, and research shows us as a general rule of thumb, the day I meet a caregiver, of dementia, they've been a caregiver for at least 10 years. And you hear in this woman's letter, her husband started to what she noticed when he was 58 and he's now 70. And that, of course, to me begins to say, what type of dementia is this? This is a very aggressive dementia. What a young man this is. And she's describing a dementia where they can continue to move right up to the final week of life because everything else that he's doing says that his body's trying to die, even though he's still ambulatory. So not everyone, because of their type of dementia, Glenda, not everyone becomes bed bound uh, for the last several months. Some people are only bed bound for the final week of life. They literally are ambulatory up until that moment. And then I think the thing that she talks about is something that is one of my greatest fears. I know any professional, Glenda, I know it's one of yours, is the care that's being given in our communities. If we compare it to cancer care, it's laughable, except that it's human care and we're not doing it very well. So when I got the letter from the lady, um, it, it was very moving. Um, at this, almost in the same hour, I got a note from the alzheimersociety.uk and it was talking about seven common guilt and grief things that people who are caregivers of people with dementia feel. And they are unique to dementia caregivers because you're full-time caregivers for full-bodied people who now have the mental acuity of a two-year-old and it takes enough of a toll on you that can, can actually, their illness can cause your death even though their illness is terminal. And so part of what I hear in her letter is she's trying to come to grips with he's terminal, but he still needs to have food fed to him correctly. And it takes about an hour to feed a person with advanced dementia, maybe even longer, mm -hmm. very end stage. But from the Alzheimer's Society, I, I got this article, and it, it's a reprint of an article that they'd done in 2018, but I thought it was, it, it so fit this woman's letter. The first thing, and these are seven things, and we're going to send them out to everybody on the call. Um, our good friend, uh, Miranda's, uh, uh, Minerva, Minerva, make sure that happens, Minerva. Um, so the first thing is feeling that others are better at managing care than you are or have been doing. And that is a, that's number one. Number one common thing is to look around as you find support groups, as you find other people, as you talk to people. I mean, Glenda and I both know the minute you say the word dementia, everybody hoards around you going, my grandma, my friend's grandma, my somebody, my, my somebody, somebody, somebody. 
And so it is common to feel like other people are doing a better job at managing the care of their loved one. And what you always have to remember is that every single person is doing the best they can in that moment with what they know, which leads us to number two, which is as you begin to learn more and more things about dementia, it's common to have feelings that you've been a bad person because of how you treated your loved one before you realized that they were, that they were ill. And for some people, Glenda, even after they realize their person is ill, you're exhausted. Uh, we've had a pandemic, uh, economy's upside down. Our country is very split. Uh, I don't know that our country's ever really been together, Glenda. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to think about, is there a time? But we are really, really at, at odds with one another. And so we've got all this stress on us. We've got horrible news thrown at us every day. And on top of that, you're exhausted because... If you're on this call, your loved one is at least in stage five and you're doing the work of 12 people. So you, you do have a, a reason for feeling the way that you feel. Number three is feeling guilty about being angry or irritated with your loved one or feeling guilty because you were angry or irritated with them in the past because you didn't realize constantly asking you the same questions over and over and over again is actually a sign of brain damage. Um, it's a sign of damage to the hippocampus, not being able to remember what you just said to me and repeating the same thing over and over is a sign of damage to the hippocampus. And so frequently when people learn more about the dementia disease process, they are very um, washed with guilt about how they perceive that they treated their loved one. Maybe your voice was harsh. Maybe you were angry. Maybe you could only say 27 times politely, it's at three o'clock before you begin to snap. And, and that's normal. And so Glenda, we have to talk about learned guilt and earned guilt. Earned guilt is I did something wrong. I did something bad. I did something devious. I should feel bad about it. I'm a human being. I have normal chemistry function in my brain. I should feel bad about that. I earned that guilty feeling. Learned guilt is when you've been taught by family or society or people around you or your culture that you are somehow responsible for another human being. And while we're all responsible for one another, you're not responsible for this illness. You're not responsible for the brain damage that's occurring to your loved one. You're only responsible for overseeing care and taking care of yourself, which brings us to number four, which is feeling guilty for wanting some time to yourself. Linda, you have a daughter. You love your daughter. I know mm -hmm. you do. You have a grandson, shark boy. You love him. Mm -hmm. Good kid. Got, got great family. You love them. But aren't there times where you just want to be alone? You don't want to cook dinner for anybody tonight. You want to make a tuna sandwich and watch bad TV, put your feet up, take a bubble bath, go to bed early, go to bed late, sit up and read a book. You just want to do something for you. And you either don't have the energy or you don't have the energy or you just can't do it because you don't have the energy. And one of the things that we're taught in the beginning of social work is that if we don't refill our empathy every day, we are not good social workers. We cannot help others if we don't first help ourselves. And that is um, something I hear frequently in dementia care is you've got to put on your mask first. But Glenda, what if you're too exhausted to even pick the mask up? Mm. And at what level does your exhaustion reach before you call your own doctor? I mean, Glenda, how many people did you and I see through COVID that even through COVID, they got their person to a doctor, but they never saw the doctor for themselves. And I know the look that I see on people's faces at conferences when I ask them, if you don't take care of yourself and something happens to you, who steps forward in your family? And you typically see a look of horror. Because we know now there are four children, there are four personalities, there are four divisions of what happens. Child number one goes, mom or dad is sick and they have dementia and dementia is causing them to die and to do these behaviors. Child number two says, 
Uh, yeah, they have dementia and they have really weird behaviors. Child number three says, don't all people get this? And child number four says, what are y'all talking about? And there really are those children. I know people with four children and we literally have watched each child become what research says there is. So those things uh, about feeling guilty for wanting time are, are very normal. But you have to find a way, Glenda, to, to make that time. So I, I ask each of you to go to this website today. It's self-compassion.org. Self-compassion.org. This is Dr. Kristen Neff at the University of Texas in Austin. She is the guru of self-compassion. Glenda, my therapist said you have to go to self-compassion.org. Tam, I want you to scroll down to the bottom of that first page. I want you to take that test. And that's what I want you all to do. And when I took that test, Glenda, you've known me for 20 years now. And you know I'm a little competitive, tiny bit of an overachiever, don't like to lose. I scored a one out of a possible five. I scored a one. I'm happy to say that I took it a few weeks ago at a conference I was at. I took it with everybody else as I made them take it and I scored a two. Um, I have gone up. I'm like to a 3.5, but you will be amazed, especially as dementia caregivers, when you realize that you really are not being kind to yourself. You're not being good to yourself. You're not doing for yourself the kindness that you would show a total stranger. And it is critical that you do take care of yourself because it's critical that you survive this disease. And that feeling guilty about wanting some time for yourself. Glenda and I have found out in the course of our careers that not everybody has $900 million sitting around to go to private pay memory care. And for some families, the way that you're going to get through is by doing respite care, by making your children cough up some money by getting funds together, by looking at your assets and determining, I can go three months if I can get a one month break, a two week break, a one week break and building respite breaks in where your loved one goes into a memory care community or to a skilled facility with memory care. And they're there for a week or two weeks or a month while you go visit grandchildren, go see great-grandchildren, go to graduations, go on a cruise. Glenda loves cruises. Ask her how to go on, go on a cruise and not get sick. She knows all the, all the secrets. But to do something for you. And I fully believe that your loved one would be horrified if they knew how you have allowed this disease, not because you wanted to, but because of how our health system is set up that this disease has been allowed to take over your life to the point that it's actually put your own health at risk. The next one is feeling shameful about accepting help. And Glenda, do you know that's actually tied into self-compassion? Part of self-compassion is being able to accept compassion from others. And Glenda, you know, I have a slideshow where I have happy person who gets uh, self compassion or gets compassion and likes compassion and is, is lovely. And the next one is a scowling picture of a guy who, who you'd be scared to meet at midnight, who is afraid of compassion, doesn't like compassion, is suspicious of people showing him compassion. And much to my horror, I found out in therapy that I'm actually the second one that ah. compassion does scare me, that, that I'm very suspicious of people wanting to do kind things and. And so that's something that, that we all have to work on is allowing others to help us. And those of you who are parents, trust me, your children are still afraid of you. Give them jobs to do. When they show up at the holidays, pull out a calendar, mark out for the next year when they're expected to be there to do help and care and turn it into a family thing and not a you standing by yourself thing. The next one, number six, is feeling tremendous guilt that it's time to move your loved one into care. And remember, when it's time to move a person into care, we would like to see people in memory care by stage five of the disease. But in our country, most people aren't diagnosed until stage five of the disease. Most people in our country do not have the money to be moved into memory care. So that's why it's so important to find respite at churches, uh, 
respite adult daycare clubs that can can help you support groups are critical that you are part of not just this one but in person support groups other support groups as much as you can do to help yourself because when it's time to make that medical move it can feel overwhelmingly guilty to you and it's because the disease was never explained to you the way the disease of cancer was explained to the cancer family caregivers. When the cancer doctor says it's time to put your loved one in care for the final part of life, the family doesn't go, now, why do you say that? And what, I'm a bad person if I do that, and we would never do that. And the reality is you don't do that because the doctor has explained the disease process to you. And in dementia, there's a good chance nobody explained it to you, but it's the same thing. There comes a point in time where medical care is needed 24 hours a day that you can't give. The woman in the letter talked about her grief of going to see her husband and then being able to see him get actually agitated in front of her to where when she leaves, they would have to medicate him. And then that fills her with more guilt as she then starts her hour drive back home. And that, that she's having to make that kind of drive tells us this is somebody in a rural area, most likely <laughs> to have to, to have to go that far to find a, a care place. And, and that on her drive back, what kind of thoughts is she having? What kind of things is she doing to help herself regain her balance? Does she understand how to do breathing techniques to regain her balance? Does she understand that this is not earned guilt? This is learned guilt. So remember earned guilt, I actually did it. Learned guilt is I somewhere picked up from society, from my parents, from my family, from something else that if this thing over here happens, I'm somehow responsible for it. That's learned guilt. And you, you shouldn't have learned guilt with this. That's somebody who has not walked in your shoes. Um, the people that I see that most fervently push against additional care for their loved one is the person who has never been there to do care. Does that sound real to y'all? The people who push back most against you are the family members that have not been there to help share care. Only Glenda is shaking her head yes. And they're quick to criticize, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, Guinevere. <clears throat> yeah, those that aren't helping oftentimes criticize what you're doing instead of understanding you're doing the very best you can under the circumstances or asking what it is that's happening rather than insisting and arguing with you that there's nothing different about this person. Mm. And all they ever have with this person, the only interaction they have is the social conversation interaction over the phone. And then the, the last one, Glenda, is having mixed feelings about the death of your loved one. And there, there's different things that can happen. I mean, we all grieve differently. Um, culture, age, sex, generation you're from, all of those things are part of it. Your religious beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, uh, what you feel and, and how processed your own grief is determines how you feel. But there are people, Glenda, who, and, and I think this is probably most true is that in our heart of hearts, you're, you're fervently praying and wishing that your loved one could just go to sleep tonight and it could be over. And then at the same time, you're so terrified that they could go to sleep tonight and it could be over. But then at the same time, this isn't the mother you knew. This isn't the father or the husband or the wife that you've had. This is now a shell of that person because of brain damage. And then if they die and you don't grieve, does that make you bad? Did you already grieve? Mm -hmm. If a person dies and then you get married in a year, are you a bad person because you remarried? I mean, we have, there's so many different things. And then there's people that I know that are like, I'm never getting married again. There are people that are already in other relationships and they haven't been to the last funeral yet. So you see all sorts of, of mixed feelings. And Glenda, I've seen everything from, 
calling a lady and telling her that if she and her family wanted to tell him goodbye, they needed to come this weekend that he was dying. And she said, my husband died eight years ago, call the funeral home. And she hung up on me. I've had family members tell me they can't come because they have dinner reservations or theater reservations. I've had families that came and stayed for a month, staying day and night, playing family videos, talking and laughing and being totally involved in their loved one. Everybody grieves differently. And in all of this, all of this grief and all of this guilt, Glenda, there is nothing to talk to us uh, about, um, I'm sorry, the painting guy knocked on my door and I have no idea what to do now, but there is, <laughs> um, to, as, as we talk about this, there's, there's just not a whole lot of support for the family that their grief may be totally different than someone else's grief. And Glenda, if y'all will hold on just a second, I'll go see what this guy wants. All right. Well, while she is away for a second, what we're going to do next, as soon as she finishes this thought, is to open it up to questions from you. And um, as I said early on in the call, you can unmute your microphone if you zoomed in. You can press star six on your telephone if you phoned in. And I wanted to acknowledge Myra and Cynthia. They both said yes, that they have been experiencing what we were talking about with extended family. And I'm certainly just speaking from what I have heard here um, about what happens with extended families. That can be one of the hardest relationships to deal with when you're a caregiver. Okay, did you take care of that? Well, he wants vehicles moved now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, see you in 30 minutes. But anyway, go ahead. You're doing great, Clinton. No, no, I was just filling in until you got back and I was preparing everybody that we probably were gonna open it up to their questions and comments. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Amory said, this is the first time I've been grateful for having such a small family. Ah, that is a good ah. you, Anne-Marie. No one to give me additional grief. So true. Ex large extended families are the ones that really just get into chaos oftentimes. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for sharing that, Emory. Anyone else have a question, a comment? concern your personal situation you'd like to talk about oh we have them lined up okay let's go okay, with Meg Marsh. <laughs> oh she's gone again and she has the expertise and so i'm sure i couldn't answer the questions she's well uh, right is though. it okay she, if i just ask and maybe some of the absolutely, other participants absolutely i'll know. make note um my husband has lewy body dementia oh. and i've been using the staging tools but I don't know that it is, it seems like I'm getting a result using the staging tools that's far worse than just on the surface looking and, and considering him, but I'm seeing all these things and it, and it stages him at a certain place. So I don't know if the tools are different for Louis body. And this ties into the grief um, topic because, you know, um, I've heard you talk about how with each loss as you go, there's another little grieving process, you know, and um, I, I, I feel like going through the behavioral, the dementia behavioral assessment tool um, is um, bringing on some grieving that I don't need to take on yet if that makes any sense. So is the is the tool appropriate for Louis body and the way Louis body goes up and down? Um, can you talk a little bit about how the tool works with that? Um, if you're using the, the DBAT tool that's on the website, then it should have a, you should notice that there are Louis body boxes built into it. So for example, mm -hmm. Um, stage three is where people with Louis body begin to accuse their family of theft, whereas mm -hmm. in the, all the other dimensions, that's a stage five behavior. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the tool is designed so that by observing the behaviors of your loved one, regardless of whether they look sick or not, 
you can see that there is brain damage. Yeah. And I would also encourage you to go to lbd.org, mm -hmm. which is LueyBodyDementia.org, mm -hmm. because they have some staging information on there as well. Um, typically with Lewy bodies, you're now going to be watching for the onset of Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. dementia, and then you'll watch for the addition of Alzheimer's. So there do tend to be multiple forms um, that occur. Glenda, you got to excuse me again for a moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Holy Toledo, here's, here's the background story. When we had storms here in Central Texas a few weeks ago, Tam's ranch got hit by a tornado. Mm -hmm. And so she's doing <laughs> reconstruction right now. And the painters happened to show up just before the call. And so she is trying to keep up with us and them all at the same time. Yeah. And my house is all wrapped. I mean, who thought they'd be here this afternoon? I was, it was about to be clothing optional pool day. We didn't know. We didn't. Yeah. Know. Um, so Dr. Tam, so um, what I'm got, seeing is that she had, that he is like 27 of the 34 items in stage five and 11 of the 16 items in stage six. But last month it was 20 of the 34 items in stage five and eight of the 16 in stage six. And that seems, it seems like I'm using the tool wrong. So you're seeing a huge, you're seeing a huge change in status that occurred in one month. And As these are things I just a, noticed, not like he does them all the time, but so stage, that I've noticed him doing them. Okay. So stage five people don't look sick. We're right. Called, all dressed up and ready to go. Right. And that's, person meeting them I think that's would think, oh, he's fine. He seems he might do something that seems a little funny, but he's okay. There's nothing yeah. wrong with him. Stage six person looks sick. Okay. A person, a, a stranger would look at them and know there is something horribly wrong with this person. They move differently, they're shuffling. He would be getting to be beginning to have lots and lots of falls. And no matter what you say, continues to try to get up. Okay. And then okay. remember they have a very distinctive fall. And when they fall with head strikes, they've got to go out 911. Do not ever take your loved one to an ER. Always call 911. That way you go immediately into the back. You do not want to sit in an ER room with a person with dementia. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Stuff quickly for them to do. Okay. Now Parkinson's has been pulled under the Louis body dementia umbrella and is now considered a variant of uh, Lewy body. Lewy bodies also mutates from person to person. So on autopsy, they found that it's not quite the same thing in, in everybody. But what it is, is it's a protein that should be living in the fluid of the brain. And instead it pushes its way into the neuron. And when it balloons, that's the Lewy body. That's the body right there. When the Lewy body expands and balloons, that's when it kills the neuron. It also starts in the area of the brain that's different than the other dementias. That's why it doesn't look like the other dementias. And they also are the second highest suicidal group. And it's because their, their serotonin levels crash so rapidly that they, they do seek to end life. Um, they tend to be bed bound at the very end only for a week or a couple of weeks. Um, they're aware of what is happening around them. They just don't have that much caring for it. And the hallucinations um, are treated with Nuplazid is the medication used for it. And those hallucinations are normal and part of the disease process. Even the dreadful one of my spouse is having sex everywhere. If that hallucination is occurring, it's a normal hallucination. It's just embarrassing and terrifying. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much. Thank do you, you know the hallucinations helpful. that we're talking about? I do you know I don't. We've been blessed, okay. and that's okay. not one of the symptoms that he has unless okay. he's there got a UTI. To be, so. <laughs> yeah, there tend to be four hallucinations that Louis body uh, people see. They see children, mm -hmm. they see bad people coming to get them and sometimes it sounds like a SWAT team or the army sometimes it can sound like family members um they see bad people outside their house so to me what is clearly a hallucination of bad people coming to get me the family can sometimes miss because they're actually naming people they know mm -hmm. the third hallucination is bug spiders rats or snakes 
crawling on me and biting me. And those are things you and I are hardwired in our brainstem not to like. So it's telling you there's damage there. And the fourth hallucination is they see their spouse or their caregiver having sex with everybody. And um, just if that ever happens, it's the disease. It's not, yeah. that's not your real loved one. It's just the disease. Is that likely to happen for someone with Louie in the later stages when it hasn't happened in the early stages? Not usually. Um, not usually. usually. It, it's unusual to see somebody with all four hallucinations. Um, so unusual, unusual to see those hallucinations yeah. suddenly happen when they weren't there before. Yeah. And you've already picked out that when pretty much when anybody with dementia begins to hallucinate and you're not used to it, there's a urinary tract infection. Okay. That, that his his things hallucinations things. have been um, uh, olfactory. So and uh, only in the very early. Hallucinations are usually something, well, there's something you see here or smell. Most of the time in Louis bodies, it's something you hear. I mean, something you see, mm -hmm. not something you smell. So that's an atypical representation. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to monopolize. Thank you very much. No, you're fine. You're fine. Hang in there, girl. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, Marcy, you had question, comment? Uh, yes, I have a question on the deep act. I was listening to... Um, I guess something on YouTube with Dr. Tam and she was talking about um, where you should take a, observe your um, person's behaviors and then reevaluate it every two months is, are you talking about the DBAT mm -hmm. um, form? Are you? Yes, ma'am. If you, if you read that every day, you begin to see your own behaviors in there and you start thinking, oh crap, I've got it too. And you don't end up seeing the, the changes in your loved one. And plus, we don't want to scare you to death. I mean, it tells you what's coming next, but we don't want you to be that focused on it. And it really can make you begin to believe you're, you're doing these same things yourself. And all they are is they're the behaviors that are presented by human beings when their brain is damaged to a certain extent. Okay. And then my other question is, you were talking about my husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, in February 2019. So right before COVID, we've only been to a neurologist three times since then. Uh, he walked out of the last one. So now I'm going to seek out a neurologist closer to home. But I, I was surprised when you said something about um, there's different uh, kinds of Alzheimer's. Yes, ma'am. There are four domains of Alzheimer's, but why would you need to keep going to a neurologist? The neurologist makes the diagnosis and the geriatric psychiatrist is the one who does the mood medications. So the, the neurologist, if it's a neurologist who specializes in dementia, would be the person that does your um, husband's medications if y'all have decided to use those. Well, he's on one medication. You know, because I never even saw the x-ray. They did a um, a brain scan or a PET scan. I'm not sure what scan it was when there, it first started. There are about 28 different tests that are done. There's a spec mm -hmm. scan, a PET scan, a CAT scan, an MRI. There's a, a variety of scans that are done. Okay. I know it was really noisy. That's all. I remember that. And then he said, there's no use of, in doing any other tests because I know that's what he has. And so why put him through all that? So... I never saw the x-ray. He says the hippocampus is very small and, okay. and, you know, like you said, I'll see you in six months. So I've been gravitating towards anything I can to educate myself. And so that's well, how I happened upon you and Tipa snow and, <laughs> and just listen to it to, to educate myself. He has a terminal brain disease and his hippocampus dying or his hippocampus size means his hippocampus is dying. And that means that it doesn't matter how many times you repeat information to him, he cannot learn it because the piece of his brain that does that doesn't exist anymore. And once the hippocampus dies, it means that he's already in stage five of the disease, which would make you question, why would you give him any medication? Because at this point, all you're going to do is drag out the worst part of the disease two to three more years when he's got the most brain damage. So mm -hmm. there's not really very much 
you know, I, I can find you doctors that will say use medicine. I will find you doctors that say those medicines don't do anything. And the reality is those medicines were intended to be started in stage two or stage three. And in our country, people aren't diagnosed then. They, they're not diagnosed until much, much later in the disease. Yeah, because even when we went in, I'm the one that dragged my feet. My kids saw it happening. And I and then when I was finally convinced maybe to have them tested, um, I had to wait six months to see a doctor. And mm -hmm. then I got that result. And I think I noticed it probably six, 10 years prior to that. Oh, yeah. A lot of families will look at the staging tools and realize that they were seeing this stuff. And yet the brain is still so healthy that you would see these glitches and then you'd see him recover just like that. And you'd think, oh, I'm not seeing it. And then one day, because you're a good, loving wife, you <laughs> opened your mouth and you told him what he was doing wrong. And then you got your head chopped off and you learn not to do that anymore, like everybody <laughs> on this call. Learn not to do that anymore because the human brain doesn't realize it's damaged. Mm -hmm. And so when you point out to a person with dementia what they're doing wrong, what they're doing different, you said sugar, you really meant salt, didn't you mean salt? All you do is piss them off because their brain doesn't realize there's mm -hmm. anything with it. And so it to that person with dementia looks like you're picking on me, you're making up stuff about me, you're trying to make me mad. And because of brain damage, it's not very hard to do. Hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes, yes, it does. So then that raises another question. He's had a lot of tests with his heart and mm -hmm. he just had a left calf um, oh, two weeks ago. And now we went to a cardiophysiologist, electro, I don't know the names. And he's suggesting that he has electrical for his heart done. And I'm thinking, are we doing all this? I mean, should we be doing all this? Because I know that a lot of people don't make it to the end. They die from something else. And I just don't know. Um, well, actually, they die from dementia. It's just that most people die in stage five or stage six, and it's due to heart attack or stroke, which is just how human beings die. And based on what you've just said, you would now add vascular dementia to your husband's Alzheimer's dementia. So it would mean there are two dementias in place there. And would your husband say drag it out as long as you can? Or would your husband say, keep me comfortable, feed me chocolate, and let me go? And you're the only one who really knows, you know him best. So you know what, his, what he would actually want you to do in his right mind. The other thing is, when it comes down to that time for movement, to move somebody, they don't, your loved one isn't part of the decision. We, we don't let brain damaged people make decisions. We don't ask five-year-old children if they want to get up for the next 12 years and go to school. We don't let them make that decision for us. And then when they go to school, we don't go stay with them every day, right? Mm -hmm. We trust mm -hmm. the school knows what they're doing. And it's the same thing with this. You can't have him be part of the decision. The decision is made between you, the community, and his doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Mm -hmm. uh, Judy, thank you so much for your patience. Go ahead. I know that you said in the notes that you have grown children that are denial and you are the issue. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about that or something else. Judy, where do your children live? Glenda and I can be there in half an hour. <laughs> we'll straighten them out real quick. Smack them around for you. That's right. So Judy, oh, are you there? I'm here, but I'm There trying. you are. There you are. <laughs> Oh, I'm here. Oh, my goodness. Um, one lives out of town and the other lives here. It, it, we're in San Antonio. Oh, that's close enough. I'm right. I'm south of Austin. I could be there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, I might need it. OK, no, I guess it's, it's a process. They're working on it. Oh, good. But it's a process for me. And I think. It is, and, I, and listening to the other lady, yes, my husband had bypass surgery, what, five years ago, that was a thing. Uh, so, um, you know, it's a, good, it's a good question to ask. Where are you? About your children? Uh, oh. Yeah. Okay, hey. you've been interrupted. Okay. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, just go on without me. Okay. All right. Thanks, Judy. You can put some more in the uh, chat box if you'd like to. 
All right. Does anybody else have a question, a comment, your personal situation that you're struggling with? Well, you know, Glenda, there was a story in the on uh, CNN or the BBC this week on um, there is a much they're they're admitting that there is a much greater risk of dementia when you have got cardiovascular issues. <laughs> really? Duh. Is that a surprise? It's the second form. I'm so shocked. I'm so shocked that we've realized if the brain doesn't get enough oxygenated blood, it'll cause dementia. I don't know what to say. But um, you do have to realize as y'all are going through the care with your loved one that surgeons love to operate and surgeons don't care if your loved one has dementia. You've got to remember that any anesthetic surgery is going to cause a decline in your loved one. You have to start every conversation about any medical care for your loved one with the thought process of they already have a terminal brain disease. So why would I want them to have surgery? Why would I want them to hurt? Why, what would be the outcome of this? Who is actually served by this? Are they served by it? Or is the surgeon who's itching to cut someone served by it? What's it going to do for them? Because it's not going to be able to extend their life. It's not going to bring back the person you want. It's actually typically going to make them decline a half a stage or a stage, depending on how long they're under the anesthesia. And so you're, to me, the mindset of, a, of us as humans has to change from we're trying to maintain and sustain life to how do we keep this person as comfortable as possible for the remainder of life? Because they have a terminal brain disease. It's just that as with all brain diseases, they don't look sick until they lose a pound of brain tissue. And one of the ways, uh, Miss Glor, to help your family can be to use terms like brain cancer. Brain cancer gets children's attention a lot more than the word uh, dementia. No, Diego, sorry, Chewini, guard dog, totally on, doc, totally on duty. So and we even know that if paramedics come to your house and you tell them your husband has dementia, they'll treat them roughly. If you tell them your husband has brain cancer, they'll treat them as though they're fine glass. So even our medical professor, professionals don't get it. <clears throat> does, does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I've got to check over here. Cynthia, you had a question or a comment. Yes. Good afternoon. I just feel that today's talk really hit home for me as far as with the self-compassion and being able to accept when it is that our loved one um, needs more professional care than our own. Um, I noticed a decline in my mom who has early onset Alzheimer's and I've been her caregiver for the last five years. Um, come about October, she was um, layering clothes um, getting very confused with trying to complete just her ADLs. Um, and it wasn't until probably April when I was like, I cannot do my full-time remote from home job and provide five hours of daily care to mom. So I was quickly on a search for a facility or some other type of assistance. And the earlier presentation you guys gave on long-term care definitely um was accurate in that the prices and the cost for it, um, while it was shocking, definitely lots of families cannot afford it. I have been lucky to find um, a facility that actually offers day respite. And we doing that for about three days now. And just my mood and my ability to concentrate in my work these last few days has completely changed. Yesterday was the first day at the end of my work day that I was not physically exhausted, ready to crawl into bed and just go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Most communities um, are now making moves to where they are offering daycare because they, they slowly seem to be realizing not everybody has millions of dollars set aside for care. And so any kind of respite care you can get can get you one day further down the road. Yes. And it's just like you all are saying, being able to go through that guilt and that acceptance and all that mental processing for yourself as a caregiver that this is in the best interest of for them and you 
are making the best choice for both of you. And if it were any other medical disease, you would have more information on it and you'd feel better prepared for when it's time to make that decision. And to be able to recognize the stress that it's taking on you, good job. Good job, because that's hard to do. It's, it's really hard to say I'm at my breaking point. I, I can't do this anymore or I'm not going to be able to function. So good for you. Thank you. Thank you, you get Cynthia. tomorrow off. Cynthia gets tomorrow off. Yeah, <laughs> Cynthia, you need a day off. Um, the phone caller, uh, area code 715, you had a question or a comment? I do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shelly. And my question, it, it, it kind of has something to do with your topic today, but then again, I, I'm learning so much. I, I currently have both parents diagnosed with dementia. They are in different stages. And my mother is, is getting much worse. Um, so what's happening lately with her is she, she does know that something's going on. She, she just says that, well, you know, my short-term disability or my short, my short-term memory is not very good. You know that that's not very good. So she does know that, but recently what's kind of been happening that I'm struggling with is she gets very angry with me if we are going to do something or we talk about something and she says, well, nobody told me that. Yeah. What, you know, why didn't somebody, why didn't somebody tell me that? And yeah, I'm the one true. that's targeted, of course, because I'm the one that spends the most time with her. Yeah. Um, and I don't really know how to handle it. Um, a couple of things. First of all, let me go back. Cynthia, you said your mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Yes, ma'am. And how old is your mother? She's currently 69. And when was she diagnosed? She was 64. Oh, good Lord. Okay. Uh -huh. And then um, back to other person. Shelly. Shelly. Yeah, Shelly. 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 Um, it is normal for uh, people with dementia to have, uh, to get very angry, very agitated, very frustrated because they don't remember that you told them. They don't remember they were at the party. They don't remember the party was at their house. And it's because of brain damage. And we see a higher level of that type of anger displayed in people who have vascular dementia, but we anticipate that type of anger that I can't get my brain to respond. And if I can't get my brain to work right, but Glenda's here, then Glenda must be the bad guy. And so I'm going to focus all my anger on Glenda. And we also see that the parent will throw themselves at their favorite child, at their strongest child. We, I call it, they throw themselves at the rock. Somehow the soul knows. So if I have somebody who is too angry, then I'm going to uh, look at the anxiety scale. And you should be able to find that on the website. It's the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale. And that's the scale that we used. Okay. It's also called the HAM-A. And you simply would look at that and check off what you're seeing in your loved one. And then that way, when you talk to the doctor, you're actually looking at a piece of medical paperwork the doctor understands using words the doctor understands, checking off symptoms the doctor understands. So there are times where people's anger and frustration at their brain not working are so high that we have to use a, a medication to calm them down, something for their mood. At other times, it's a matter of us learning the correct way to respond, to approach, mm -hmm. and to not ask questions. One of the biggest things we do is we challenge people with dementia to prove to us they're sick. And we don't do that to any other disease. We don't tell people with COPD to blow up balloons. We don't tell people with amputated legs to run down the hall because they used to, but we do do things like that to people with dementia. So if I know my loved one wanted sugar, but they said the word salt, that is not a teaching moment. This is not a growing brain. This is a dying brain. I simply give them the sugar. Does that make sense? It, it does. Sense. It absolutely does. But I think for me, what's, what's been getting more difficult is when she gets angry with me, I, I need to know the right way to respond. 
you know, I, I know I can't, I can't say, well, I told you that mom. I mean, I, I just don't know what I can say that cause she's, she gets upset. I mean, she'll even get upset about something that, you know, hasn't actually happened. She'll say, I, I, which I know this happens to a lot of people, but she'll say, I, I can't believe that your dad did such and such. And he didn't tell me about it or he didn't ask me about it first. So she she gets upset about things that never happened. She's where, mad where? about things because. Are you at any chance in Austin? I am not. I'm in Wisconsin. I'm a long ways away. <laughs> okay. You need Wisconsin. to call in Wisconsin, call a couple of memory care communities near you and ask who their Jerry Psych doctor is. Ask for the marketing person. Ask them for the Jerry Psych doctor because that's who your mother needs to see. And they will give her okay. medication. What you're seeing is acute anxiety. Go online and print out the Hamilton anxiety scale, fill it out. And then easiest way to find a, a a dementia doctor in your area is to call the memory care buildings, ask the marketing people, who do they use? Because they know all the doctors okay. in town that specialize in dementia. And y'all have some really good memory care community groups in, um, in the Wisconsin area. So uh, try those, okay. and you find, but you're dealing with acute anxiety, not, it, it comes out as anger, but it's anxiety and it can be treated. Yay. Okay. Well, thank you for that very much. As a side note I to everyone that. on the call, if a nurse ever comes towards you wearing gloves and wants to put a new cream on your hands, they're fixing to medicate you. So just be aware. Oh, that's a good one to know. And the mom, yeah, when, they put, when they put AB gel on you to calm you down, they always have gloves on. And like, let me put some lotion on your hands for you. Then they start rubbing your wrist and then you get very, very calm. Oh. They will not get ABH gel. I've tried to get it, ladies. I'm sorry. Yeah, darn. Your, Thank your you, mom, your, your person needs an, uh, something for anxiety because that's yeah. what you're missing. Their brain's not working and they're so anxious it makes them angry. Thank okay? you, Shelly, very okay. much for, for sharing Thank with you. us. Um, let me take a couple of the uh, comments over here on the chat box, then I'll get to you, Marcy. I see that. Uh, Javi said, for the purpose of which dementia is present, is there a particular type of neurologist to take the loved one to? This is one of our common questions. Uh, you, you have to have a neurologist who specializes in dementia. Most neurologists do not specialize in dementia. Most neurologists have no interest in dementia. Um, the best places are probably going to be any place where you've got a university medical school. There will be a geriatric department that does uh, treatment testing for dementia, and that's where you would want to go. Okay, and the next one is Anne-Marie. Um, let me see, did Anne-Marie go away? She may have, but it's something that, you know, she was saying she doesn't know whether she's approaching her breaking point or not. Oh, there you are. You just jumped to the other side on my screen, Anne-Marie. Uh, she said she thinks one of her problems is she doesn't know whether she's approaching her breaking point, Tam. Well, if you're, the, the rule of thumb is if you're questioning, am I there? You're there and past it. It's like meditation when people say, I don't need to do breathing meditation. Everybody goes, oh, you need it twice a day. So if you're thinking, am I at my breaking point? That's your body and your brain trying to say, you're at your breaking point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, Tam. Mm. Uh, okay, Marcy, question, comment. No, I already had my piece. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but thank you. All right. Well, we, we're going over like we always do. So if you need to leave, we certainly understand that, but hopefully you'll stay. Uh, Shelly, did you have something else or you just didn't mute your phone back? Um, you know, I didn't remember how to mute my phone back. Just with, do I have to do something I can, special? I think I can mute? do it for you. Let me try that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe not. Well, if not, it's, it's fine. I think star six will mute you again. Okay. Oh, so okay. we're a little bit after two. Let me make sure I've taken care of everything. Michael, you've had a lot of interesting things to say. What is your background? Oh, thanks. I'm mostly here kind of post taking care of my wife because uh, I still try to support uh, other caregivers where they're uh, still living. But my wife, Sharon in San Antonio is 
diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at age 61. Uh, she probably had signs two or three years before that, but she passed at age 69 at a, a small facility in San Antonio called Pipestone Place that took great care of her for the last 16 months of her life. And yeah, my big thing is uh, I kind of learned the hard way is that because Sharon's decline was so gradual about like I get used to it, but I didn't realize how far she had declined. And I, I think the comments from Dr. Cummings and you all are so helpful. And where I got a lot of help was I was in an Alzheimer's Association sponsored support group for a few years and just meeting with my peers first in person and when COVID hit online uh, was, was so helpful. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, Michael. I just was curious because you were so right on on a couple of your comments that I knew you had some history there. And I heard the thing about like sometimes family members don't accept it or sometimes it's us, sometimes it's like the children, adult children. And what I found what real helpful, I didn't really need it for this reason, but to bring in a, a social worker that's trained in coming into a situation and and talk, listening to the family and so forth. But I had a guy, doctor, or not doctor, but guy in San Antonio, Russell Gaynor, who came in and he pretty much told me, yeah, your wife shouldn't be driving anymore. And she wasn't necessarily fighting it, but I was still letting her drive, but I probably let her drive a little bit too long. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to have a bad guy other than yourself that you can say, well, here's what the doctor said. Here's what the social worker said, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else have a question or a comment? I think these sessions are wonderful. I know that I get so much out of them. Minerva, you're unmuted. Do you have something? Uh, just going to let you know, Cynthia posted something on the chat box. Okay. And another one. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cynthia, she said the struggle with early onset is that your loved one Okay, it jumped, excuse me, looks young and others do not understand. Yes. And they certainly don't look sick, right, Tim? Nope. So they must be pretending or acting like or faking it or showing off or lying. And it's brain damage, just brain damage. And yes, people go, oh, but he looks so good. And that's because they don't lose weight and they don't lo look sick until stage six of the disease when they've lost an entire pound of brain tissue. And that to me is just phenomenal. Every time I say that, Glenda, it just, it, it amazes me that the human body is so complex that we don't look physically sick until we lose a pound of brain tissue. So we let someone keep driving a car. We, yeah. we, we think someone's okay to stay at home alone. We, we think they're okay with the house and finances mm. and computer until they're not. Right. And it's, you know, you're, you're, you're torn because this is the person you're married to. This is a parent. This is an adult. And you're slowly watching them turn into a child. You're watching them become somebody that is not the person you loved. When you get staging tools, when you get enough information, you can go back and realize I was seeing this 10 years ago and just didn't know what it was. And it wouldn't have mattered if you had. You, you would have drug them to the doctor and the doctors wouldn't have known what you were talking about. So it, it really does come back to, we're all doing the best we can at the time and in this moment with what we know. Yeah. And when you know better, you do better. Yeah. And if you haven't done okay till now, that's okay. You'll do better tomorrow. Yes. Um, and Anne Marie um, commiserated with you, Cynthia. She said her husband was not quite 60 when he was diagnosed with the Lewy body. Mm, my goodness. And those are very, very aggressive to be that young. Um, yeah. Those are just terribly aggressive dementias. And I am so sorry for what you've all had to go through. Yeah. And Marcy, uh, she said this is her first session. Marcy, go back onto uh, the Carrier Teleconnection website. And look up the podcast that Tam's done. She has a whole series there that you can start at the beginning and work your way through. I think you mentioned you had seen either her or um, one of those before, but you know, go through the whole series. It'll help you a lot. Um, 
Oh yeah, and I get this one that Anne Marie also said, and people say, "Well, he looks so good," which makes her grind her teeth. Absolutely, Anne Marie. Yes, and Michael agrees with the dementia as a brain disease, brain damage. You know, when when Tam said that, and she and I have been working together for you know twelve years or so, more than that, I think. And the first time she mentioned that, Michael, it was just like an aha moment for me too. Yeah. Because if people would would talk about it as a brain damage, there would be a lot different treatment. Well, do you uh, know they, they changed the name officially to major major neurocognitive disorder, which sounds scarier, Glenda, dementia or major neurocognitive disorder? Yeah. Well, the problem is it's still too complicated. I have had people call me going, well, I thought my dad had dementia, but it turns out he's got major neurocognitive disorder. What does that mean? And so we didn't do a good job of explaining it. No, absolutely not. Um, sucking at this, y'all. We got to do better. We got to do, do better. We have to do better. Um, Cynthia says the TSA at the airports are the worst because if you're <laughs> coming through there with somebody that has dementia. Mm. Instead, tell them brain cancer. The minute you say brain exactly. cancer, people go, oh my gosh, brain cancer. He's got brain cancer. Help him, help him, help him. And if you say dementia, they think they're doing it on purpose and they're harsh. Judy, you're back. You wanted to say something? Oh, you got to unmute your phone. Unmute, unmute your microphone. Oh, this. Okay, thank you. My husband's seen the gerontologist at the VA this week. Is there something I should ask? Um, fill out your Bristol ADL, IADL tool. It's on the uh, Tam Cummings website. Fill out your DBAT staging tool. If you think your husband's having anxiety or depression, you have tools for those as well on the website. Print those out and take them to the doctor and make sure the doctor gets them before you go in with your husband. And then Glenda and I will always tell you, we do not sit side by side with our loved one. We sit behind them so that we can say no. And you can go, you know, Judy. But by and giving that, them that, a staging tool, by giving them the anxiety tool, any of the tools that you use on there, you're giving doctors medical tools that they're accustomed to that explain to them what is happening to your loved one better than you can because you're not a physician you're not trained to use that terminology so when I say uh, somebody's having anxiety to me medically that may mean something totally different than it does to my sister who doesn't have a, the degrees I have does that make sense yeah so it's the Bristol and what else did you say uh, do the Bristol, that was the ADL, IADL tool developed by the Bristol Medical School. Um, do the dementia behavioral assessment tool. I'm guessing your son, husband is in late stage five. Maybe six. Okay, and you're not going to be seeing a gerontologist. You're going to be seeing a geriatrician. Children see oh, pediatrician, okay. they see geriatrician. So the geriatrician should be familiar with your paperwork, okay? Okay, because the neurologist doesn't, isn't really interested in that, in my no, opinion. because most neurologists don't study dementia. It has, okay. the, it's not their interest. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> this is a question. We, we got you, Judy. I <laughs> see so you've been interrupted again. Uh-huh, um, got a little for, handsome, handsome fellow there. Yeah. I'm good, I'm good. Okay. For those of you that want Tam's um, website address, I know Minerva put it up early on the chat box. For those of you on the phone, it's www.tamcummings. Uh, wait a minute. Yes, tamcummings.com. That's her first and last name squished together.com. Okay, well, we're getting close to 15 after, and uh, let's see. I think that I've got everybody covered. I always make sure I don't miss somebody that's written something in the chat box or unmuted their microphone. Um, all right. Well, Tam, let's uh, call it a session if you don't mind. And uh, do you have some final words? And I'm going to look and see what's coming up on the calendar while you do that. 
just everybody remember you really are doing the best you can at the time with what you know. Your loved one really does have a brain disease and that's what you're witnessing. And it's just that we don't have enough skilled professionals to really help us and help you get through this, but you're doing the best you can. Good. Thank and you unless so somebody is standing in your shoes, they don't get to open their mouths. Yeah. And they don't get to criticize at all. No. Your children are still afraid of you. Just remember that. That's right. That's right. So coming up on the Caregiver Patel Connection, we, and we have a new series since this is Pride Month, the Pride of Caring, Issues for LGBTQ Caregivers and Professionals. So their first session in that series is tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And it's with Lucy Barilock and Dr. Elliot montgomery Sklar, And they're going to be talking about how is caregiving different for LGBTQ plus caregivers. So that's four sessions coming up in the month of June. Um, and then on Thursday, the 8th at 10 o'clock, Lucy will be back and Dr. Jenna LaBelle. And they're going to be talking about caregiving with chronic pain. Now, as uh, Tam mentioned, we will be sending out a follow-up email to you if you registered for the call today. And we'll be um, putting in there those steps that we got from the Alzheimer's, hmm, not the steps. Now I've lost my train of thought that we started with the guilt and how to address that. So that will be there and some other resources that we've discussed along the way. We'll also ask, ask you for your feedback on this session. So let us know how you think that uh, Tam did on the session. If you have topics or presenters that you've heard and you would like us to cover those in the future, let us know about that too. Uh, let me just make sure that I haven't missed anything. Michael, the upcoming mm -hmm. sessions, are they the same time? Um, if you will look at our calendar, Michael, that is on the Caregiver Teleconnection um, website, you will see all of the upcoming sessions so you can plan your um, attendance that way. And there's the calendar and the website address. Well, Glenda. With that, Glenda. Yes. yes. This is, this is, yeah, this is going to be Dr. Cummins, when are you coming back to San Antonio? Because the last <laughs> time I saw you, you were at the Shrine Auditorium in the West Over Hills Baptist Church. I met you. That's been a while ago. Yeah. Well, you know, prob the probation period isn't up yet, so I'm not allowed back in Bear County until then. So we'll just have to wait and see what the judge says. And if, you know, if that happens, then I'll be turned loose again. I'll be in a bright orange 1951 Chevy pickup truck. Look for me coming down 281. And it is a fine vehicle. I have seen it. So <laughs> You can just stop in Kendall County. In oh, Vernon. yeah. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> I only got bucket seats, but I do have air conditioning, full stereo, yes. system, automatic transmission, and a brand new uh, transmission with overdrive. I'm telling you, she looks slick going through the country, but she needs to go to all the counties in Texas. Well, and I'm sure some of the counties in the other states, too. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm glad you took time out of what I know is a busy uh, schedule for you. Uh, please look at the calendar and see what things and topics might uh, be helpful to you. And Tam and I will see you next month. Are we going to do the same format next month, Tam? Yes, ma'am. Right after yes. the slides. Yes. The yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Guinevere, you Not didn't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll see you on the next session. And please be safe and take care of yourself. Take your own oxygen first. And there you go. We will see you in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.